Great. Uh, well, we're reading, we're continuing to read in Ephesians, and we're going to read from uh, Ephesians chapter 6 this morning, and we're going to be looking at verse 5 uh, to verse 9. So let's read Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 5. Slaves, obey your masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward, will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favouritism with him. Well, during the past year, it's become very clear that the racism in humanity and utter abhorrence of the transatlantic slave trade is still impacting society today. And I have to say that with the murder of George Floyd still fresh in our minds, it's felt raw to come to this passage and to think through the legitimate place that slavery had within society in the days that Paul was writing. A society within which Slavery is acceptable, feels so wrong and uncomfortable to us, doesn't it? It's hard for us to get our heads around that, and that's a good thing. But it must be said that the transatlantic slave trade, where people were forced into slavery on the basis of their race and on the basis of ethnicity, was very different, actually, to the kind of slavery that Paul's referring to here in these verses that occurred centuries before the transatlantic slave trade in Roman times. Slavery was part of the fabric of society at that time, so much so that it's estimated that at least 30% of people were slaves in Roman times. It was acceptable not just within society as a whole and not just to slave owners, as would be expected. It could also be an acceptable way of life to slaves themselves, as we'll see this morning. Though people were still taken into slavery at that time on the, on the back of war, many others entered into slavery voluntarily as a legitimate way of making a living. Those people included lawyers and labourers, physicians, doctors and farmers. Now in, in, an, era, in an era when we have the, NF, uh, the NHS and the benefit system and relatively high levels of employment compared to that time, it, it's hard to imagine that it, it, what it would take for someone to voluntarily enter into slavery so that they might be able to provide food and clothing that their family needed. But, but at that time, many Christians would have been slaves because it was one of the few options of, of employment that was available to them. Added to that, there would also have been a number of, of slave owners, maybe converted after they became Christians. And it's, and it's important to see that that's the context that Paul's writing into here. He's not writing to households where slaves had been taken against their will. He's writing to Christian slaves and, and Christian slave owners in order to draw out what their relationship should look like in Christ. And it's important to remember that, that Paul's continuing to write to, Paul, uh, to, to Christian households here. That's how slave owners were to treat their slaves, just as much part of the household as any other family member. He may well instruct slaves to obey their masters in Christ in verse 5, 
But that's because, as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, the Christian household as a, on, a, on the whole was to be a place where everyone was submitting. Everyone was submitting to each other out of love for Christ. Just as husbands were to self-sacrificially love their wives and as wives were to submit to that loving leadership and as both husbands and wives were to submit to the need of bringing up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord and the children were expected to submit to that instruction, slaves were expected to submit wholeheartedly. And verse 5 to 8 details how that submission was to be worked out in the household. Slaves were to have sincerity of heart. They were to throw themselves into their work wholeheartedly. And they were to do so for the good of the household. Uh, well, is this then a case of you're going to get in that house you're going to do exactly what I say and when I say it, and you're going to do it with a smile on your face. Is that what we're dealing with here, that kind of oppressive environment? And clearly, the vulnerability of the slave and the authority of the, of the master could be an oppression, for, could be a recipe for oppression and abuse, right? Well, maybe, yes, definitely, in, in some households at that time, but not in households that belonged to Jesus. Before we think any more of what's expected of slaves, let's have a wee peek at what God expects of a master in verse 9. Get this, are you ready to have your mind blown? My mind was blown by this during the week. What does, what does the start of verse 9 mean? Have a little peek, I'll read it to you, but, but what, does, what does this mean? The start of verse 9. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. What does that mean? What does it mean in the same way? Well, let's have a little look as we work back through what Paul's just said. We've got to work back to see, well, in, in the same way, what does it mean? Okay, we'll work back through what Paul's just said in verse 5 to 8. And, and as we look back through verse 5 to 8, there are a number of things that we come across that he may well be telling masters to do in the same way as their slaves. So is he, is he telling these masters to treat their slaves <clears throat> in the same way that the slaves treat them, by doing good to them, as it says in verse 8, or by serving them wholeheartedly, as it says in verse 7, or by serving them for the glory of God and as slaves of Christ, as it says in verse 6. Or maybe they need a little bit of that respect and, and sincerity of heart as they dwell in their slaves there that it talks about in verse 5. Well, actually, it's, it's a trick question because he's not telling them actually to do any of those things on their own. He's telling them to do the whole lot. You see, God's intention wasn't and isn't to enable a system of abuse in the household, but to enable a system of equality and love within the household. Masters were to treat their slaves in the same way as slaves treated them by submitting to them in all of the ways mentioned above in verse 5 to 8. Now, when in our dog-eat-dog, dog, winner-takes-all, survival-of-the-fittest kind of world, it's hard to compute that, isn't it? What do you mean, masters submit to your slaves? It's counterintuitive. But again, Paul is writing to Christian households here. What does authority look like in like from a Christian perspective, from a Jesus perspective? Well, let's take a journey back again to Mark chapter 10 to find out what authority looks like in a Jesus kind of perspective. <clears throat> it says this in verse 42 of Mark chapter 10. Jesus called them, that's his disciples, together and said, You know that those who regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. 
Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Within a Christian world view, the higher you go up the ranks, the greater the servant you should find. That's why in this post-Christian country of ours, we have a prime minister at the top of the tree. To minister to someone is to serve and care for them. And as the one appointed to care and serve for their people, the prime minister is the primary minister, the, the primary server and carer of their country. Now, I'm, I'm, I know it might not always seem like that with world leaders, but they're not meant to be in it for their own good, but for the good of their people. What's expected of them is to stand out, not from the crowd, but from the country in their level of service. They're to lead through submission to the needs of the nation that is under their authority and care. Just as Jesus did, as he bled and died for the world upon the cross, in order to cater for our needs, the need that we have of forgiveness and new life with God. Now, with, with those things in mind, being a Christian slave master was a huge responsibility before God. For the glory of Christ and in the way of his love, they needed to make it easy for their slaves to fulfil their role with joy and satisfaction. They needed to care for all of their needs, making sure they've got everything they need in order to do their work for the glory of God, all, all the rest that they need, all the equipment that they might need, and all the reward that they should have for their services. Slaves may not always have been valued in society. They certainly weren't in Roman times. They, they, they were despised. They were neglected in their households. But things were to be different in the church. Paul wanted slave masters to see that Jesus bled and died just as much for slaves as he did them. They were incredibly important and valuable in the eyes of God. Before they were slaves and masters, they were brothers and sisters in Christ. It was their servant king who was first in both of their lives. Their highest authority and the one that they wanted to replicate, honour and obey in the way that they treated one another was Jesus. They were equal in their standing before him. Equal in their accountability to him for the way that they treated each other. Far from masters using their authority to lord it over their slaves and, and treat them harshly and badly threatening them. Slaves were to be part of the household, part of the family unit, and were to benefit from the privileges and the responsibilities that came along with that. Now, in the modern day era, slavery doesn't exist, but work obviously still does. Whether we're in school, in employment, or at home, or in retirement, we all have work that we're called to do, that the Lord calls us to do for his glory. And in one or all of those places, even today, we may well feel oppressed. We might be unhappy in our lot in life because of the way that we're treated, probably from those in authority over us. From the moment that we're born, we have to do as our parents tell us. We then go to school and, and we have to take everything given to us by our teachers with a yes sir or a yes miss. The school bell then rings on our time there and we step into the freedom of employment where our yes miss and our yes, mer is, yes, yes sir is, 
is, is transformed into a yes boss. At some point, we may well meet the love of our lives and, and get married, only to find out that we have to live in submission to them as well, as we saw back in the previous chapter of Ephesians. Finally, at the ripe old age of 65, not for you kids, you'll be going uh, until you're about 80, we step off the merry-go-round uh, of work and, and enter into retirement. Only to find out when we enter into retirement that having that amount of time on our hands can be even more oppressive and, and, and bring a greater sense of, a, of enslavement than we've ever experienced in our whole lives. Whew. However, as we grind out this life on a day-to-day -day basis, we and those in authority over us do so as those who are accountable to the Lord. And that makes the world of difference to whatever stage of life that we might feel trapped in. Our fathers, teachers, bosses, lover, they're all accountable to God, whether they like it, want it, know it or not. Knowing that sets us free from any sense of entrapment or enslavement to any circumstances that we might find ourselves in in life. Whether at school, in, in work, or at home, or in the denture clinic, we can know that it's the Lord that we're ultimately serving. It's him who's led us to where we're at in life, and, and he is the one who's going to lead us through it. He is the best and most wonderful master that we could ever wish for. And it's our joy to serve our servant king wholeheartedly, isn't it? And with all sincerity, as it says in these verses. And as we do that, do you know, we'll be able to deal with those power-hungry, bossy boots who tread all over others in order to stay on top. We'll be able to deal with them with a gracious smile on our faces, knowing that not even Jesus came to be served, but to serve. We'll pity those who are in it for themselves because we know someone who has taught us something so much better and he's called us to live in his way in this world. The way of service and, and of love and of looking out for the needs of others. It's our privilege to reflect Christ in the world and to live out his way of life in the hope and in the prayer that it will catch on. And that others will also come to know that he has died to save them from their dark and twisted self-orientated lives as well. Amen. Well, let's pray uh, before we sing. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you are the King of Heaven, that you are the one who could love us uh, and treat us so much better than anybody else ever could, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that it is it is you who we are serving ultimately, Lord. We we love one another. We submit to one another for your glory. And Lord, we help. We pray that you'd help us. To do that lord it's it's not easy to do that we recognize that and lord we we pray that you would help us um to to honor you to worship you uh lord in this in this world and lord if we are if we are in a situation where um people don't treat us rightly they, they don't care for us as we as we should be treated as those who are made in your image and those who are loved um so much by you that you sent your son to die for us if we're being treated badly in that way Lord, again, would you really sustain and help and strengthen us and help us, Lord, to, to continue to serve with a smile on our faces, knowing something so much better and knowing a love that is so much greater, uh, Lord, knowing that this life isn't all about me, me, me. It's about uh, loving you, loving each other and, and Lord, serving um, and caring uh, for the benefit of others. So, Lord, would you be with us? Would you help us? Help us, Lord, to um, be, con be contented, uh, Lord, and to um, be thankful and to be worshipful in whatever place that you've called us to live in. Help us to work for you, whatever stage of life 
we might find ourselves in. And we ask these things for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Great, well, we're going to sing a song. What other song could we sing uh, right now than This is Our God, Our Servant King? So we'll sing that song. And then five minutes after that, we'll meet up on Zoom for tea or coffee. I look forward to seeing you there in a little bit.